It's time for health, your super informative turmeric latte charged ginseng powered antioxidant rich natural health podcast with a slice of lemon. And I'm your host, Greg Newson, naturopath, herbalist, nutritionist, and we're here today for the Vitality and Wellness Centre. <music> Welcome to part two of our cholesterol podcast. And in this episode, we're going to look at saturated fats and cholesterol. We're also going to discuss, besides cholesterol, what other blood tests can be a very important indicator that you may have cardiovascular disease. We're going to discuss the pharmaceutical medication to treat cholesterol. And obviously, we're going to look at the natural treatments of cholesterol. One of the most common things that we hear in regards to cholesterol is you have to lower your saturated fat. Well, 75% of the body's cholesterol is made by the liver for a start. And saturated fat, I always feel, has got a bad rap. But is that bad rap justified or is it to perpetuate the myth that cholesterol is really, 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 really bad? Let me explain. Let's, let, me, let me delve into something. Just humor me here and bear with me. I look at my grandparents, my great grandparents, and and they lived, they lived until their nineties, and they had lard and dripping for, on toast. They ate the fat from meat, and I just look at them and think, well, how the hell did they do it? And they didn't die of heart disease, but we've got to watch every little bit of thing that goes into our mouth. Back in their day the meat was grass-fed. Now, when meat's grass-fed, it becomes anti-inflammatory. Meat does act, grass-fed meat actually contains omega-3 fatty acids, which is the same fats that are found in fish oil. But when you start to feed a meat grain or an animal grain, you change that fat to become quite inflammatory. So saturated fat gets bad press. But one of the higher sources of saturated fat is not animal products, it's not meat, it's coconut oil. Now, coconut oil has numerous health benefits. But if we even scrap that, how about an avocado? Who's eaten an avocado recently? 20% of an avocado is saturated fat. So I'm not really buying the fear factor that's put around saturated fats. By all, meat, by all means, I should say, trim the fat off your meat. You know, I do. I, I, I wouldn't sit there and eat a whole fatty rind off the steak. So what does the science say? What do the studies say? Because after COVID, we were all told a certain little furphy here and there, and we've found that they're not true. And we found out really what you hear in the media and what you hear on the news and in general conversation might not necessarily be the truth. So let's delve a little bit deeper. Let's see if there is any studies that show that cholesterol is good or is bad. There's studies that show that lowering serum cholesterol concentration does not reduce the mortality and is unlikely to prevent coronary heart disease. And that's, that's a scientific study. Other stu- another study says that uh, lower LDL, which is your bad cholesterol levels in patients on statin drugs, which is your cholesterol lowering medication, is associated with a higher all cause of mortality. Well, that ain't good. Lower cholesterol is associated with poorer outcomes in critically ill patients. And here's a really good one. The hypothesis that LDL cholesterol and saturated fat consumption is the primary cause of heart disease is faulty and not unequivocally supported by the evidence. Fair income. Okay? Righto. So there is these studies out here that dispute what the mainstream narrative is. And I'm kind of looking more at those because these studies aren't making money. They're not making money out of cholesterol medication and they're not making money out of stopping you from eating a certain food. Now, if you start to look at when saturated fat became bad, what did they replace saturated fat with? Margarine. We got rid of butter, we had margarine. You know, margarine is highly toxic. It, think of it this way. You've got, what, canola oil? Let's get some canola oil. Freeze it, boil it, let it sit on the shelf and tell me if it ever goes hard. It won't. So what they do is they break down the molecular structure. They, they hydrolyze the vegetable oil. They generally use nickel as the agent. And then that makes it solid, but it's a gray looking thing. So then they've got to put artificial or uh, certain colorings in with it. They might even just use beta carotene in some of them. And then they've got to put vitamin A and vitamin D and to preserve it. And then they pass it off as a, um, I don't know, I don't know what you'd call margarine this slop that you put on bread, I don't know. Whereas our grandparents, our great-grandparents ate butter. They ate butter. And heart disease was, or cholesterol was never really an issue. 
cholesterol medication or cholesterol was never really an issue until the 70s when they found a medication that could lower it. So we've got to stop thinking that cholesterol is bad and, and look at it as a warning sign from the body. The, it's like a flashing light. It, it's just saying, hey, something's not right. We need to adjust something. Now, the way medicine adjusts something is they give you a drug which basically removes the flashing light. So the light's not flashing anymore. So everything's great. But what we really need to know is why is the light flashing? Because just removing the light doesn't fix the problem. Now, we're constantly being told that cholesterol is bad and it's a major cause of heart disease. And where cholesterol can be a problem for heart disease, as I've mentioned, there can be a buildup of plaque on the artery wall and too much plaque on the artery wall restricts the blood flowing through the vein or through the artery, I should say, uh, which puts more pressure on the heart, which can drive up blood pressure and it can also cause one of those plaques to dislodge. So focusing only on cholesterol as an indicator of heart disease is like looking out your back window at the sky and seeing a little white fluffy cloud, but not noticing the massive dark gray clouds of a storm approaching out your front door. So it's really not giving us an accurate indication of what's happening with our heart health. Now, let me explain. There is some very important blood tests that will give you a better understanding of, of heart disease and how cholesterol fits into that picture. So when we look at cholesterol, we look at the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol, and they're generally done in a blood test with your GP with total cholesterol and um, a ratio between the good and the bad. Before we look at the blood tests or talk about the blood tests, Let's look at cholesterol itself. When, when the liver produces cholesterol, it produces this big beach ball size cholesterol, for argument's sake. And that beach ball bounces around throughout the body, drops a bit of cholesterol off of the brain, goes to the eyeball, gives a little bit of cholesterol there, goes to the kidneys, a little bit goes there. A couple of other cells in the body get some cholesterol and it starts to shrink and it shrinks down to the size of a squash ball. Now, when they test your cholesterol levels, they generally weigh it. They can't tell you whether you have one big beach ball or 100 little squash balls. So when you get a blood test, there's a more accurate way of determining the amounts of good and bad cholesterol in the body. And that is APOA1, which, is, which measures the major proteins on the good cholesterol, and then APOB1, which measures the major proteins on the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. So once we have an understanding of that, we can then see what whether your bad cholesterol is really bad, is really high, or it's not. But with that, we also need to look um, at CRP, or highly sensitive CRP. CRP is a marker of inflammation, and heart disease is a massive inflammatory disorder. So we often call inflammation the silent killer because you don't know you've got it, and you don't know that it's causing damage or destruction to tissue until it's too late till you have an aneurysm or you'll have a heart attack. There is another marker that can be measured that gives a really good indication of your potential um, for, for heart disease, and that is a substance called homocysteine. Homocysteine is one of those um, substances that cause the little ulceration or the little sore on the artery wall, uh, now then, which then that drives inflammation. So homocysteine is basically a deficiency of B6, folate, and B12. So that's pretty simple to fix up. Uh, fibrinogen, which tells us how sticky and thick the blood is. So obviously you can imagine the thicker your blood, the harder it is to push that blood through the, um, through the veins and the arteries. And then that can then cause um, plaque to dislodge as well. And the other one, which doesn't get measured, but it's the worst kind of bad cholesterol, and that's lipoprotein A. Lipoprotein A can quite easily build up on the artery walls quicker than any of the other LDL or bad cholesterol can. It increases the risk of clotting and it promotes inflammation, which can cause your blood vessels to rupture. But you never see it on a standard blood test. <laughs> Why? Hmm. Could be that vitamin B3 plays a very important role in lowering lipoprotein A and cholesterol medication not as much. But just putting it out there. In Australia, you can ask your GP to measure the fibrinogen, the APOs and the CRP and the homocysteine. You may have to pay 20 or 30 bucks to get the lipoprotein A measured. I don't think that's under Medicare. But that gives us a greater understanding of our whole total 
cardiovascular disease, risk factors, not just cholesterol. So if your cholesterol levels are elevated and you've gone to the GP, they will generally put you on a class of drugs called the statin drug. Now the statin drug inhibits the body from manufacturing cholesterol. Now this you may think is a very good thing, unless you have hormonal issues, unless you have inflammation of the brain or the nervous system, or you need to repair your cells, or you need vitamin D. As we've already discussed, cholesterol does have a lot of important biological functions to perform within the body. The way that statin medications work is that they inhibit a substance called hydroxylmethylglutarol coenzyme A, which is commonly abbreviated to HMGCOA, right? Technical stuff here, sorry about that. But that is one of the precursors that the body uses or it needs to make cholesterol. So when you think downstream of HMGCOA, I'm going to get that stuffed up every time I say that, um, it doesn't get manufactured by the body. It just doesn't happen. Now, there's a couple of important things here. One of them is squalenes. Now, they believe that squalenes... Um, stimulate immune function and they help prevent against cancer but there's not i couldn't find them in many scientific studies only some animal studies but squalenes are also what's found in uh, shark liver oil one of the next steps down from squalene in the cholesterol production is a substance called coenzyme q10 now coenzyme q10 is a very very important intracellular antioxidant with the highest amounts actually being found in the heart so it keeps the heart muscle the tissue that pumps every second of the day healthy by protecting the mitochondria in the cell and the mitochondria is the energy factory of the cell q10 has always been found to help people suffering from fatigue and improve exercise performance but it's also been shown to help you know with things like cancer or brain health so it has a wide range of um, therapeutic benefits which i'm not going to go into every single one of those now but it's a common nutritional supplement in america i believe that every statin medication has to have on it by law uh, must be taken in conjunction with coenzyme q10 or words to that effect in australia they don't tell you anything about it they just um you know <laughs> take the drug but that could be one of the reasons why a lot of the statin medications cause fatigue and joint and muscle pain because coenzyme q10 is known to protect against those issues what I find quite interesting is that in nature there is a natural statin and it's found in red yeast rice. Interestingly, there is a food found in nature called red yeast rice that contains uh, a chemical substance called monocolon K and that chemical is identical to the active ingredient in the cholesterol lowering medication drug called lovastatin. Now, I was always told that it is illegal to patent anything found in nature. I wonder how the pharmaceutical companies got around that. So to protect the interests of the uh, statin medication, the red yeast rice is banned in Australia and the United States, and I dare say other countries as well. In Australia, it's illegal to get. You may get it in some Chinese um, whole food shops. Uh, in America, the FDA blocked the sale of any supplement that contained red yeast rice uh, because that made it as effective as lovastatin, and that red yeast rice hadn't gone under, uh, hadn't undergone their drug approval process, so you weren't allowed to have it. If it looks like a rat and smells like a rat, is it a rat? <laughs> mm. Looks like the pharmaceutical companies have won out again. Could I just be as bold to say there may be a little bit of money changed hands somewhere along the line? I don't know. Now, with there is many different types of statin drugs, so I'm not going to go into every single uh, medication and talk about side effects, but there are some common side effects that are, are associated with statins in general, and that is muscle pain and damage. This is generally because their body is unable to produce coenzyme Q10. It can also cause liver damage, so it raises your liver enzymes, which is a signal of inflammation in the liver. Uh, it can increase uh, your blood sugar levels or type 2 diabetes, but that can easily be fixed by just taking a blood sugar pharmaceutical medication. It can also cause neurological side effects, and that's because 25% of the brain is made up of cholesterol. <laughs> it's not rocket science. And then there's the common everyday signs and symptoms that people can get, whether it be a headache or burping, excessive flatulence, 
you know, constipation, your voice can go on, you can have trouble sleeping, heartburn, reflux, indigestion, runny nose, excessive sweating. All of those things can also be attributed to um, the statin pharmaceutical medication. So what can be done to lower cholesterol levels naturally or just maintain healthy cholesterol levels? Well, I'm glad you asked. One strategy we use in the clinic is to give people uh, algae and grasses. So spirulina, barley grass, chlorella, alfalfa, wheatgrass, they're all obviously very green, but they're either a grass or an algae. And there's a lot of studies that show that those nutrients can help lower elevated cholesterol and maintain healthy cholesterol levels. So instead of taking a pharmaceutical medication, we'd rather give people some natural things. So not only do those grasses and algae lower cholesterol, but they also improve liver detoxification, kidney detoxification, boost immune function, deodorize the blood and the bowels because they're high in chlorophyll. Spirulina by itself has over a hundred different nutrients. So it's they're like living superfoods. So not only helpful with cholesterol, but also numerous other effects on the body. Now, as a herbalist, I'm a big fan of herbs and one of the most important herbs to lower elevated cholesterol is garlic good old common garlic that ha- that thing that you can grow in the garden the thing to buy from the greengrocer or that you can take as a herbal tincture has been shown to dramatically reduce elevated cholesterol especially in people that have had high high cholesterol for many many years as good as garlic is at lowering cholesterol it is not the only herb there are numerous common herbs that also help to lower or maintain healthy cholesterol levels turmeric ginger dandelion burdock Globe artichoke, green tea, schizandra berries, St. Mary's thistle or milk thistle, barberry, all the berberine type herbs, whether it be philodendron, golden seal, barberry, they all help lower cholesterol. Interestingly, a lot of those herbs in particular, globe artichoke, St. Mary's thistle, barberry, turmeric, dandelion, green tea, schizandra, andrographis, they're all also liver herbs. So they help promote the health of the liver. As we know, the liver manufactures the cholesterol. So an unhealthy liver, you might not be producing cholesterol efficiently. We just mentioned the importance of the green foods in the algae and the grasses to help lower cholesterol. Also part of our treatment strategy in the clinic for elevated cholesterol are antioxidants. In particular, goji berry. Goji berry has been shown in numerous studies to lower quite elevated levels of cholesterol. Other red herbs or other red foods that are going to help is any any of your purple berries, any of your cherries, your strawberries, your blueberries, your blackberries, things like um, rosella, rosehip, acai berry, pomegranate, beetroot, even moringa leaf. I know it's not red, but it's very high in antioxidants. Not only do antioxidant-rich foods help lower cholesterol, but they also support liver detoxification, kidney detoxification, strengthen the immune system, protect against cancer, and have an anti-aging effect by keeping our cells healthy and young. I bet you can't do that with a pharmaceutical medication. (laughs) Yeah, that's my little swipe. What you may not know because it's not been pushed in the mainstream narrative that is that there are some everyday foods that have been shown again in studies to help lower cholesterol. So first one is almonds. Studies have shown that regular consumption of almonds lowers elevated cholesterol and maintains healthy cholesterol levels as as does rice bran oil, oats, good old porridge, flax seeds, chia seeds, Cucumber seeds, you know, who would have thought cucumber seeds? Any wild caught seafood, whether it be shellfish or fish itself, uh, because they're high in omega 3s, so krill oil and fish oil will also be beneficial. Fibres such as psyllium husk, inulin, apple pectin have all been shown to lower cholesterol, and it does that because it binds to the cholesterol in the intestines before it is reabsorbed and takes it out when you go to the toilet. Number twos. A Mediterranean diet has been shown to have numerous health benefits for a healthy heart, and cholesterol is no different. The studies have shown that it will help lower elevated cholesterol and maintain healthy cholesterol levels. So what is a Mediterranean diet? A Mediterranean diet is a diet that is high in unprocessed grains and cereals, legumes, olive oil, fruits, vegetables, with moderate intake of meat, dairy, and seafood. But there is no preservatives. There's no fast food, plastic cheese hamburger with a black cola drink and a side of fries. It's a diet high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, pulses, beans, whole grains, with moderate amounts of cows, chickens, eggs, oysters, prawns, and dairy. 
Now, one food I haven't mentioned that we know is very important to, uh, and studies have shown, dramatically decreases cholesterol is red yeast rice. Uh, and and it, it sounds funny, but it's red rice with a bit of yeast on it. And it's the yeast that contains the, the chemicals that helps break down or prevent the production of the cholesterol. But if you do that, you're going to have to, if you take that, if you can find that, you're going to have to take coenzyme Q10 with it because the chemical structure is the same as the statin drugs. And the statin drugs do inhibit cholesterol manufacture, which then inhibits coenzyme Q10. Something else that's going to help that's not diet, but it's exercise. So healthy diet and exercise is going to keep your heart healthy. Uh, it's, I'm not preaching anything new <laughs> this is not cholesterol advanced this is cholesterol 101 so it's it, it we, we have known for years that a healthy diet and exercise prevents our heart disease so something else that will help prevent high cholesterol is our good gut bacteria so the healthier the bacteria is in the gut the less the cholesterol build up in the body so if you've got an unhealthy gut and you've got an overgrowth of bad bacteria or harmful bacteria, worms, parasites, amoebas, fungal spores, and not enough good guys, it's a thing called dysbiosis. I spoke about that in the podcast on digestion. But when it's like that, you're more prone to having elevated cholesterol because there's pressure placed on the liver and there's pressure placed on the digestive system because it can't eliminate cholesterol effectively. So Healthy gut, healthy cholesterol levels. So if you know you've got poor digestion, bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, flatulence, smelly poo, smelly gas, burping, reflux, heartburn, they're all signs of poor digestion. So you may want to look at the digestion side of it if you have elevated cholesterol. If you would like help treating cholesterol naturally, just go to vitalityandwellness.com.au and purchase an initial consultation and we'll go from there. Or alternatively, give us a call. If there are any of the supplements that you would like to help normalize your cholesterol levels that I've mentioned, such as the algae or the antioxidants, the grasses, the uh, liver herbs or the fibers, just go to vitalityandwellnesscenter.com.au podcasts and click on this podcast on cholesterol and there'll be a few products listed there that may help with uh, normalizing cholesterol levels. So now the legal stuff, anything that has been mentioned is purely educational and not meant to treat, diagnose or cure any disease. If taking any nutritional supplements, please contact your healthcare professional before doing so. And we do not advocate in stopping any medication unless under medical supervision. Until next time, this is Greg. Live life and laugh loud. Yeah.